Well, I should be the one to collect the proof with this state-of-the-art device. All done. As newly inculcated members of the undead, you will experience periods of bloodlust which you will have to satisfy. These cravings can only be quenched by the consumption of living human brain. Just keep you going. Any questions? Gordon. Done. Hey, panelists, welcome back to the show. I'm Mark. And I'm Steve. And I'm Laura. Hey, Laura's back. Yeah, <laughs> welcome, welcome. Thanks, guys. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we didn't get Witcher out to you guys, with Lara and Steve, but eventually we'll go back to it. You know, there's a lot of time because there's not a lot of content out there eventually. <laughs> so we will get to it at some point uh, to finish up the last of, what was it, the Henry Cavill <laughs> yeah, the Henry, uh, Henry Cavill Witcher. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, for now, we are continuing our coverage with uh, Good Omens Season 2. So keep in mind, this is a spoilerful podcast, which I don't really think this is spoilerful since a lot of the listeners and viewers have out there have been able to watch the show from the time it's been on. It's been out for a while, and we just haven't gone back to it. There have been times like I took a week off. Steve took a week off. We just didn't. And then yeah. Rob has been out. So we haven't gone back to it. But eventually we will finish this up. We're going to we plan to finish this up this week with three and four. And it's spoiler for spoiler for blah, <laughs> just like I stated. And uh, obviously with five and six, we'll finish up uh, the season. And then after that, obviously, we'll get to Loki. But like I said, this episode episodes three and four of good omens so episode three is i know where i'm going and also featuring the minisode the resurrectionists or resurrectionist mm -hmm. is it just one <laughs> and uh, you figured out the deal with the minisodes steve yes yeah i i think i think tv podcast industries clued me in on it that the that's the title of the b basically the b story the the episodic part of this yeah of this series is these mini they're calling him the minisodes Little flashbacks that, yeah the flashbacks that are within I don't the episode think of them as minisodes i think they're just incorporated within the episode yeah it's a weird <laughs> it's a weird way of wording it for for the titles to to put it. and it, it does come up on the screen when you pause it in amazon prime it comes up and says featuring the minisode you know the resurrectionist so it, that's the actual title but still it's a little it's a little strange it's like why would they just like put it in parentheses or something maybe i don't know i that confused okay. me too. I was yeah. for a little while clicking through Prime and X Ray and everything. I'm like, where's this mini sode? Yeah, I'm, I'm like going to YouTube, going, "What's the mini? Where's this mini sode at?" You know, and it's like it's not <laughs> showing up. I'm just, and then, like I said, I think it was TV Podcast Industries. I think it was their podcast that mentioned that that's the title of the. You know, you got the serialized main storyline story. with, yeah. with Gabriel and and Heaven and Hell, and then you got each episode has its own episodic mini sode. <laughs> mini so yeah let's just we'll use their word for it I but the, well it, it's it's <laughs> actually something that somebody had online that's why i have that in there actually i think that was in the title because that that's what i'm saying like when you pause amazon if you pause it on amazon prime yeah it's at the top of the screen it says that whole all those words come up as the title of the episode so okay so yeah but my feeling is it's just the episode <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. or flashback or whatever. So, yeah, I see it as a flashback and a continuing episodic uh, tale of Azurafel and Crowley or Crowley? Crow Crowley. I think it's Crowley. Crowley. Yeah. Yeah. They call him Crowley, but uh, I like saying Crowley. I've heard it both ways. Like <laughs> Alistair Crowley, <laughs> but because he's kind of, you know. He's a demon. Anyhow, uh, <laughs> the synopsis for this, uh, Steve? Heaven sends the angel Muriel in disguise to spy on Aziraphale and Crowley. Uh, Aziraphale drives to Edinburgh to pursuit, in pursuit of his clue and learns a little about a lot. It's a weird sentence. <laughs> <laughs> the, couple's, the couple's visit to Edinburgh in 1827 involves grave robbery, a statue, and an unfortunate encounter with a vial of laudanum. In the present, Crowley is in charge of the bookshop and is disappointed by human beings and the weather. So <laughs> there we yeah. go. The, the weather <laughs> and how it interrupts uh, a coupling, as it were. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
I, it's funny too thinking back because we we covered the first two episodes and you know i really like the second one but i'm really catering more towards two and four now but i still like three and one was a great setup so that's my overall thought <laughs> mm-hmm. uh i i just like the uh the different views within it uh of like uh Aziraphale and Crowley's relationship and how it progresses. And then even in the minisodes, you you get mm-hmm. to see how their relationship over the eons have prospered and how, and you can see their dynamic. And that's what I enjoy about this. Yeah. Uh, it, it, we get to see it, it's, there's a kinship there that, that you can't break. And I don't think heaven or hell could actually break it. So mm-hmm. I, I think that's what is so amusing to this because they're complete opposites but they still are great friends together i don't know <laughs> yeah i mean i for my part i think i'm enjoying the the flashback the minisodes even, even more than the kind of main storyline the a the the main plot because it's just so right now i mean we can see from watching three and four together we can i can kind of see where it's going with that main mm-hmm. plot you know but it just it doesn't that story just to me is not I don't know. It's it's not as compelling as I'm enjoying the the flashback uh, parts of the episode more than the like I said the the a plot line or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> yeah, I I think this season is overall just not as plot heavy as season one. Yeah. But I think there's a lot of focus on character building, especially with. Aziraphale and Crowley here. We're d- getting a lot more of their backstory and more of their character building. Mm-hmm. Um, so this episode is was my favorite so far in the series. I love it, but mostly because of it's kind of a vehicle for that very quirky British humor. And I grew up watching Monty Python from a young age. My uncle worked for the P- for PBS, and so oh, wow. he got me into watching Monty Python when I was like six, seven years old. So I love that mm-hmm. quirky British humor. And I love that the minisode took place in Edinburgh, which was a place that I visited like three, three or four years ago. And it was so amazing. I just loved it. So it just gave me those nice feels of uh, Edinburgh, which is a bit of a, uh, I describe it as a a total Tim Burton town. If you ever go there, it's it's got all these dark spires and castles like right in the middle of the city. So it (laughs) it worked perfect for a uh, grave robber storyline. Nice. Well, especially when Elspeth actually when they when she, when Aziraphale goes, I'm Mister McFell, uh, and then she kind of is like, Oh, English, <laughs> like because Edinburgh is literally part of Scotland, uh, right? Am I correct, Laura, in saying that? Okay, yeah, yeah because is it I, is it is it a different island than Great Britain, or is it the same? I, yeah. I'm, I'm so not a geography person. Like it was just like three or four years ago that I realized that Great Britain is technically an island, and I'm like. It's a pretty big island, but uh, yeah. like I feel like an idiot. Like I was in my late, like I said, I was in my late forties before I figured out that oh, it was from a, an episode of Lost where yeah. uh, Desmond is talking about it. He's like, oh, Great Britain is an island. Okay, so Scotland. Where is Scotland in relation to Great Britain? Or is it, it north? is north of yeah. It is north of okay. England and Wales. Yeah, it okay. is up north, and um, it it does have some smaller islands as part of it, but it is the main northern part of uh the uk okay yeah okay and it's always some sort of like hostility between you know scots and english and welsh yeah because i've yeah. been to they wales. Don't have a great history no they yeah. don't <laughs> I, i've been it's to like wales the north and south Scotland, of america so yeah <laughs> you're a yank <laughs> okay but uh yeah uh, uh the, the one thing with me or the only way i know about it is through iron maiden because <laughs> they're uh their manager is Scottish and he comes from Edinburgh. <laughs> okay. So uh Rod Smallwood is uh is uh a Scot nonetheless. Excellent. And uh, and I think their uh, lead guitar player Yannick is uh, as well. But yeah, you know, doesn't really diverse them. Yeah, it, it's a bit diverse, but it's the same country, honestly. Nonetheless. Let's say that to Scott. Watch and, out. Oh, oh don't I tell that. that to Lucy. Oh, okay. trust me. Yeah, that's like calling an Aussie uh a kiwi, a kiwi, a kiwi, yeah, a kiwi yeah. and Aussie, or, vice yeah, or vice versa, vice yeah. versa. Yeah, you get smacked in the face, <laughs> <laughs> or or a soccer ball, or football to the face. Actually, <laughs> um, 
But all right. Yeah, I, I think overall, I think we like this episode. And from what I could tell, th- there's parts about it that I do truly enjoy. But th- there's certain key parts of the, the this show or the episodes, I should say episodes and, you know, the episode or slash minisode. And I think we have a basis of like what we're going to talk about. So, uh, Lara, since you're back, why don't you tell us your uh, first uh, favorite scene within it? Okay, uh, I think um, I start off with the Minnesota minisode mm-hmm. of the Resurrectionists. Um, it's the name of a bar in Edinburgh, but it actually is also um, the story of these grave robbers that <clears throat> Azarafel and Crowley encounter in 18th century Edinburgh. Um, and it, it teaches Azarafel a little bit of a, a lesson in not everything being black and white because Correct. he's he mm-hmm. meets this young lady, Elizabeth, 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 Elspeth. Elspeth. Yeah. and and the wee Morag. <laughs> I love, I love that yeah. name. If I ever get another cat, that's going to be her name. <laughs> Wee Morig. But, uh, you know, he, they, they, she's robbing graves so that she can feed them. And Zarephel instantly thinks that she's doing evil and um, comes to realize that not everything is so black and white. Yeah, they, you see that diversity between them. Curly is more less to the idea of how it's like oh she's evil and then of course right away Azarafel goes she's evil that, that's like plain and simple because she's stealing a body and she's taking it for whatever but as soon as he sees uh, that she's there for we more and it's to get them food take care of themselves set themselves up uh, you can tell we more is not feeling well and they care for each other just you know two friends that are the the caring for each other and that it's meant for money and to take care of each other. And it, it really is a, uh, it's an eye opening. And I think Crowley actually uh, sees it too on the human perspective. Cause usually he's like, Ooh, I love the evil, but mm-hmm. then he starts to see, and he starts siding with Esbeth, uh, Elspeth during it. Uh, and what her reasoning for it, and it, it's it's a bad to do good, and whereas Curl, uh, Azarevel thinks it's just bad, and then he they meet up with the the doctor that is the Surgeon, reason why whoa, they... This is one of my points. Okay, because I, I I was kind of confused by this, but I I, I got to think back to the eighteen hundreds, right? Because mm-hmm. they call him a doctor, but he goes, "No, I'm not a doctor. I'm a surgeon or a chemist." Like, <laughs> now he says surgeon because I, I just okay. rewatched it today. Because he says I'm a surgeon, and then uh, Aziraphil calls himself a doctor. So he's calling them doctors, and he's a Mister because he's a surgeon, mm-hmm. which I just didn't I didn't get because we don't have that separation here no. in nowadays, right? We we don't really. I mean, you have you have doctors who specialize regular in, practitioner, and then you have right. a, an actual surgeon, an actual who surgeon, specially right. specializes into something, right? But we and, don't we don't distinguish them title wise. We call them all doctors, correct? Uh, but I guess back then, if you were a surgeon, you you were addressed as a surgeon, which I thought was kind of interesting. Yeah, and you know he he convinces Azarafael that what they're doing is good because he's like, well, I have to teach my students how to cut into a body and how to identify places and the fresher cadaver I have to, you know, teach them on the, the better they're going to learn. You know, he shows them those jars of that, of that stuff that he has. He's got a tumor that he took out of a child, you know, and uh, all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's it was an interesting conversation between Aziraphale and, and the surgeon when he's convincing Aziraphale that this whole grave robbing thing is actually good. And we do learn about laudanum. Mm-hmm. So, and uh, what it, what, it does. Elspeth uh, does nick that from the doctor or the surgeon, actually. Yes. <laughs> but I did yeah, like, I like that discussion of, uh, you know, what is good and what is bad. And that surgeon sets himself up to seem like he's doing the virtuous thing by taking these uh, desecrated bodies and um, 
starts doing research on them, which is a good thing. But he also sits there and he's like, you know, we just don't have enough murderers because uh, <laughs> if we had more murderers around here, I'd have, have more, more availability bodies. to bodies. Because yeah. <laughs> they like get something out of Frankenstein. <laughs> Mary <Yeah>. Shelley. <laughs> there. Speaking of, now that, you know, October's <laughs> not too far away and Halloween's not too far either. <laughs> <sighs> But uh, that actually comes from that as well. That that also gave me a, a little bit of hint of that. That's you know as morbid as it is. I like that. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, well, Steve, did you have one that was favorite? But you already went um, into surgeon. Yeah, one, I already but, kind yeah. of thought the surgeon, the surgeon doctor thing, and, and all that was was uh, was a really good discussion. Again, that's the um, I did I did notice you know, the running gag. I think it goes from episode three to episode four is Crowley consistently in the bookshop carrying a stack of books and then just throwing them off to the side. Like <laughs> that's a runner that they've been doing for, for the, both these episodes because his has been gone. And it's just, I'm just like, where is he? What is he doing? Why is he carrying those books? And then he'll just throw them to the side. And I'm just like, what, what are you see? So yeah, that for me was one of those moments every time that happened. I know that was in kind of the a plot story, but, uh, um, but yeah, his, his manipulation of the weather, trying to get it to rain and he gets the, he gets the two women under the awning, but of course, before they can kiss the awning uh, breaks and, and they just get, yeah, just Operation get, Lovebirds I, doesn't go well that uh, mm-hmm. without a hitch, uh, with a hitch that he wants, but yeah, uh, it, 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 they tried, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, they're still trying. They, they both want that to happen. It's their infatuation with. Uh, the human condition, I think, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and yeah. how they relate to each other. It's as if they're examining humans to in their relationships, so they could have better relationships. Well, uh, it's I, like they don't have a a hands on knowledge of what love is. At least for humans, <laughs> they they have a textbook knowledge of what love is. And correct, uh, Zarafel gets his uh, textbook knowledge from Jane Austen and uh, <laughs> Crowley gets it obviously from rom-coms, which I just imagine he sits around watching every evening. Yeah. 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 Um, with me, I, oh, that whole beginning of human talk with uh, Muriel stopping into the shop dressed as a, a constable, but it looks like an older constable's uniform. It's all white. And, so they'll, and somebody sees that from a distance goes, okay, that's a thing. <laughs> yeah. So not subtle. She's just like, it's so not subtle that uh, the, the, the constant uh, talk between her and Crowley and the Xerophel and then referencing human because she's referencing human. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm a human police officer. <laughs> I'm a human police officer. Right away. <laughs> they Inspector know you're constable. Angel. Yeah, yeah Inspector Cross Crowley corrects her. He goes, "Well, you're that's an actually an inspector's uniform right there." Well, I'm an inspector. It was a constable's constable. uniform, but she said she was an inspector, and she's like, right. "Yes, I'm inspector constable." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so. that the heaven has no clue as to what happens on Earth and how things are. So they well, and uh, I love that. I love that quote from from uh, Crowley when they when he and uh, Aziraphale go off to talk, and uh, he's like, "I don't know how you, I don't know how you guys remain." in charge and Aziraphale says are we actually in charge are we really Do you, really, <laughs> you know oh. oh man and I love that she sits there and, and she she catches on really quickly that she might have um revealed herself as not being human so yeah. she sits there she says I've been here the whole time I've been here 200 years yeah like, yep. like it's not a big deal for any human to be around for 200, 200 years, years. Yeah. yeah they yeah. have no that's obviously of mid, midlife right there yeah. <laughs> I transferred from somewhere, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I, yeah. I, she doesn't say. And then uh, the, the whole thing about drinking tea mm-hmm. after Aziraphal gives it to her, she goes, well, I'll just hold it and look at it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you can't be tempted the way Aziraphal was. Yeah. Which is so funny too, because as soon as they get tempted and they get into it, they, yeah, it's not a bad thing. <laughs> Everybody loves her. I too. love her character. She is absolutely adorable. Yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah, it's funny too because this is like a foreshadowing only to what we see later on in the next episode with Shax, mm-hmm. too, because uh, they they wind up trying to do the same thing from Hell as well. But of course, you know the the wool is thrown over uh, Azirfel's face at that point, which brings me to the car with <laughs> uh, Azirfel and how. He takes the car, but the car literally drives him. He does not drive the car to Edinburgh. 
<laughs> <laughs> and I just love that aspect. And then the the fact that during his travels, he changes. He goes. He, he he's on the phone, or he's talking to Crowley, and he's like, "Well, are you eating sweets in my car?" <laughs> he goes, yeah. "There's what no eating favorite? sweets in my car. Oh, did you change it, Yellow? That's not what my car sounds like. Change it back." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he kind of magicked it <laughs> to mm-hmm. be what he wants, and he's like, "Oh, all right then." <laughs> Puts it back. <laughs> But uh, I just like that, uh, especially with the car. The, the car had its own personality, which was mm-hmm. I thought was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. And and we see that more take in the on next the episode. personality of whoever is driving it at the time, whether it's yeah. Crowley or Aziraphale. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's great. It's like the changing colored horse in The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> uh, if you think about it, it adapts to somebody's mood, maybe. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot. That was one of my points is uh, Aziraphale and Crowley's manipulation of humans and objects. You know, I love how Aziraphale will, he, he politely asks the gentleman in the graveyard if he could borrow their cell phone. Yeah, and then he charges <laughs> it for him. Think, and... I use it for, I only use it for, what is he? I use it Twitter for uh, and grinder. Twitter and gr- <laughs> grinder. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and the other guy no had a tattoo quote. on his forehead. I was just, <laughs> I couldn't decipher it. <laughs> Yeah, but the I fact couldn't... is, is that they both like at that point were understanding and said, "Here's my phone. And he's going to use it." And then he handed it back to him, and it was like, "Oh, it's fixed." <laughs> yeah. Well, you worry for poor Azarafel, but he's so sweet and, and of course, angelic. <laughs> the guy obviously hands him his phone, and he just talks to it. It says, "Please call the phone <laughs> in my bookshop." <laughs> Yeah. It automatically rings through to the bookshop. It magicked it basically. It's like yeah. oh, done. Uh, I, I, they have I did no like clue that. how human technology works, but they they do like to use it. Yeah, yeah, they manipulate it for what they need at times. But honestly, if you look at the bookshop and you look at his love of vinyl and music like that, he's still trapped in a certain age. Oh, but yeah, yeah, he's just he's all into the classics. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, what else did I? Oh, I I saw that Jim apparently has his own mug. Adorable. And it says Jim's I love mug it. on it. So obviously they had to separate certain things. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's still in the bookshop. He he was told to uh, stay away, and he I guess they told him that what uh, Wednesdays are yeah, the bookshop is closed on Wednesdays. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we didn't we didn't see much of him this this episode. We saw some of him once Muriel left the left the bookshop, but uh, yeah, we yeah. saw we saw the statue of him in the the graveyard. Mm-hmm. That was one yeah. that, that true likeness of him. Uh, we saw the likeness of him that Azarafel must have drawn of him, which was perfect. It looked nice mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, when he was talking to the pub owner, and uh, that's when yeah, that that's another part that I did enjoy was seeing him go to the pub. Now, when he approaches the pub on one side of the sign, it's. A man robed. It looks like something out of biblical. It makes you mm-hmm. think of Gabriel himself. But on the other side, it's a butcher. Yeah. So I, I, was, I didn't notice it the first time. The second time through, I I noticed and, that change. And it made me think of what the the pub owner, or the uh, the bartender, states, stating that yes, he did come in, and he was in this wonderful gray suit. And they're masons, and he knew that they were masons from down the road or something. But there was somebody else. So it's making me think that Gabriel, the reason why that pub was chosen, it was like destined for Gabriel and his other person who, who knows who it it could be. It could be somebody from hell because Gabriel Mm -hmm. came from heaven. Right. And it was like a meeting place. And I don't know that it, it had, it just like launched ideas in my head. (laughs) I was like, there's something going on there. And there's something, there's like a, there's got to be a clue to the ending episode that brings everything together <laughs> for each <laughs> because uh, the book of Job that we dealt with in episode two, Steve, obviously they got mm-hmm. that whole story wrong completely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We talked about that last, the last episode, but uh, yeah. it was amusing. Nonetheless, it, 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 they had their own little go of it and put their little twist on it. So, but this one, same thing. We find out it was a year ago to that everything was happening with the jukebox and the Buddy Holly song coming in. And I thought that was pretty cool. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, Cause it, it kind of opened up and that's what, these are the little things that Aziraphel finds out and he's all excited about. And I'm a journalist. <laughs> I forget what, it, what he mentioned he was exactly, but it was basically a journalist. <laughs> yeah. But, I'll step into the confessional here and just let you guys know that I have already seen the whole series, but I'm not going to give, I'm not okay. dropping any spoilers. Okay. <laughs> I'm not even okay. going to hint at that. The I, fact I've that been I know loyal things. to it being like uh, episodically or even mm-hmm. if we're doing it, doubling up. I, mm-hmm. I've watched just those two episodes. Yeah. That was not going to work further. for me and my watch partner, who's my young yeah. teenage daughter who couldn't <laughs> wait to watch this. So gotcha. as soon as she, gotcha. we got the chance, we watched it together. That's totally cool. understand. That's still cool. I, I a friend of mine, my friend Teresa, actually watched it as soon as it came on that day. She watched the whole thing through. <laughs> I said, mm-hmm. "What are you gonna watch now?" She goes, uh, "There's something else." <laughs> <laughs> she goes, "I'll listen to you as you uh, cover it, and then uh, <laughs> I'll watch it again." I was yeah. like, yeah. "Okay," <laughs> but I, I I know those people. I'm one of those people too. It's like if it's on Netflix, I got to breeze through the whole thing, but I'll forget majority of half of it, and then we do when we do the podcast, I'll watch it. But in this case, I wanted to watch it episodically. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah, that that's all that I had within this. We pretty much have every little bit that, that came in. Did you have something else there, Laura? I saw in the doc that uh, you wanted to bring up. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, yeah. Let me see here. Um, so, well, first I wanted to go a little bit into Elsbeth and Wee Morag. The one thing that what gave me a little bit of a chill in this episode was when the um the cannon that was meant to protect the graves shot Wee Morag, oh. and then she dies, and immediately Elsbeth I uh decision is to sell her body to Dr. Dalrymple. And mm-hmm. I was like, oh, that's her because <laughs> you know, this show's so full of humor, you don't really think that that's gonna be a thing. And then that was that got a little dark there. It and and then dark, she tried yeah. to kill herself, which Crowley stopped, which surprisingly, you know, you thought that would be Azarafel who tried to stop her. And not, all of a sudden Crowley does it by consuming the entire bottle of laudanum and then just tripping out completely. <laughs> that was a great scene. Him getting big and then getting small and don't step on me. And yeah. I uh, mean, if anything, if he was a true demon, he wouldn't, he wouldn't have intervened because that would have directly sent her down to hell and Mm -hmm. he knew that he like he was the one to stop her and say yeah nope not a good thing and he encourages Azarafel to give her money so that she can go uh, buy a farm and he says go farm farm and be good and he said not pretendy good (laughs) proper good yeah, I like I, I like that, that the, the, the theme the theme we're kind of getting of these of this season, and I can't remember if it was this episode or or the next episode when they talk about the black and the white, and uh, Crowley says something about well, it's it's the dark gray, and uh, Zerafel says no, it's a light gray, you know. So they're really they're really getting that they're mixing they're kind of mixing the two of these guys because they both have been basically, you know, for lack of a better term, Zerafel has almost fallen himself, but he hasn't been rejected by heaven. But he's not part of heaven either. So he's kind of in between. And Crowley's the same way. He's still kind of part of hell, but not totally. And so mm-hmm. these these two guys that have been together for so long, mm-hmm. it's it's interesting to see that, that that juxtaposition is the only word that I can think of that of these two guys, uh, like you said, Laura, uh Aziraphel, you would think would just let her kill herself, but he doesn't. Aziraphale's lying about things and he's supposed to be the good one. So it's, yeah, it's interesting. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Um, it was just apparent in the last episode, how lonely they were. They've all both been isolated or exiled to earth because they're supposed to be the hellish and heavenly ambassadors on earth. And as Zarafel tells Crowley, how hard that must be to um, go, Oh, just go so far with hell, but mm-hmm. not all the way where Zarafel is, it's kind of learning to do the same thing. He he goes as far as he can for heaven. And then when he just, his morals can't line up with what they dictate, he, mm-hmm. he backs up or finds loopholes. <laughs> yeah. So it's going to be interesting to see how this, this season plays out and how the rest of it goes. I, I, I agree with you, Laura. I, I like that we're getting more of character. It's not as much plot driven as it's character driven this season. Yeah, let, let's, I think the first season was more driven to the whole, whole story with them consumed with it, whereas this is more about them 
which mm-hmm. probably is what Nate, uh, Neil Gaiman's uh, idea of like, because the characters are beloved from that. Everybody just loved the distinctness of each character and how they were. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, when I read this book back in the 90s, I loved the characters. So loved them even more when they were played by David Tennant and um, Michael, Michael Sheen, Sh- because yeah. they just embody those characters completely. Yeah. The, and it's a bit complete different uh, character for Tennant, if you think of him as the Doctor, or as Kilgrave in in Jessica Jones. So, mm-hmm. so in Doctor Who, he's a well, completely different character, and then uh, Kilgrave is extremely evil, if you think about it. He's, you know, mm-hmm. Well, and he, Michael Sheen has done so many characters. I mean, he was in Prodigal Son. He played the father in yes. Prodigal mm-hmm. Son, the serial killer, and looks nothing like how he looks as a zero fell, they completely change his, his look and everything about him. And he just, he gets into a character that way. That's really, really great. And, and Tim, it's the same, the same way, mm-hmm. you know, he's getting into this character and, and uh, like Mark, you and I, we've talked about before, they did the, they did the whole first season. So they really have this kind of uh, chemistry with each yes. other. Yeah. And you can see it too on YouTube during the pandemic, they did a couple of things together, which were pretty cool to watch. Yeah. Staged. My daughter and I are watching through that now. No, oh, nice. <laughs> She's obsessed with these two. I'm telling you, <laughs> it's it's uh, it's like the Laurel of Hardy of today. I think kind of mm-hmm. like, uh, but in a sense where they know how to play each uh, play off each other perfectly, no matter what characters they get too. So I'm curious to if they would actually do something later in the future, just on their own. I would love to see that. Yeah. I think there's one main thing that we missed that we might want to discuss is um, at, almost at the end of the episode, we get Gabriel Gabriel's kind of memory or prophecy. Yes. Is, uh, it's like an end of days. starts pushing him. Yeah. And he, he starts to repeat some things. And I wrote down, he said, the dead will leave their graves and walk the earth once more. And yeah. that to me uh, sounds like some rapture going on mm-hmm. there. Correct. The yeah. Dead will yeah rise. Very apocalyptic. Yeah. Yeah, because that is yeah one of the things that is talked about in the I don't know if it's Revelations or the Rapture, but yes, it's the the rising up of the dead with the second mm-hmm. coming of Christ. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's it's interesting. I don't I, won't, I don't want to get into the theology of it and all that because it's 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 so convoluted a lot of times. But uh, I like Laura. You had in your notes about Shaq's body swooping because what we're going to see we saw in this episode is she confronts Crowley about is Gabriel in the bookshop and Crowley is trying to convince her. No, uh, he's <laughs> not in the bookshop. And she just keeps continually repeating to him. Yeah. He's in the bookshop. He's in the bookshop. But I realized, and I think it's actually the next, the next episode, episode four that where we, where they point this out, the yes. bookshop is apparently on the grounds of a church who is formerly a church. So it's like Holy ground and, and she can't enter unless she's invited. Um, Correct. Is, I don't remember uh, if that, I, I mean, they might've, I can't remember if they said that it was on a church, but I think it is, is he said it's basically still like em- an embassy for heaven. So it's okay, like a U.S. embassy t- in another country, but okay. it's kind of like uh, still under heaven's protection. Okay. Even though okay. uh, heaven didn't know where it was exactly because <laughs> mm-hmm. maybe it's because he was an angel and he opened it up as his own being since he's an angel from heaven. He has jurisdiction over it. So they have to be invited in. Very much like a vampire into your own home. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, the angels can can go in. It's just the demons that can't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, even still, they do ask for uh, an invitation. L- look at uh, Muriel. She got asked to come in. Oh. She has to come in. Yes, <laughs> as well. But the, it's still funny how whether it be Shax or Muriel or anybody that looks at Gabriel, they don't see him, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it's only. Aziraphale and Crowley that that know <laughs> that that's Gabriel. Gabriel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because and I their still... minor miracle that they were supposed to create, their very undetectable minor miracle, apparently was uh, twenty five Lazarus strong. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was I thought that was great when Crowley brings that up in this in episode three, where he says, "Oh, that's how you measure the strength of miracles. <laughs> how many people it could bring back to life." You know, and <laughs> and I I still wonder. I'm still a little bit on the fence about whether it was their miracle or whether Gabriel did something to, you know, jack up the power of their miracle, uh, their miracle, or just his mere presence of being in the shop when they did their miracle jacked up the power of it. Cause you, you would think 
Or maybe it what was when, what was inside the box that we didn't know. That mm-hmm. could be also, and we're still we're still seeing this fly that's flying around that we don't know what that is, what you know, what the the fly of it all is. So uh, that's um, gonna be a Schrodinger's cat. Who knows? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, was there anything else that you guys had? Well, that was in my notes, Steve. That the shacks switching bodies like that reminded mm-hmm. me of fallen with denzel washington if you've ever seen that mm-hmm. oh yeah, yeah. he's trying to, to, to defeat a demon mm-hmm. and the mm-hmm. demon just keeps jumping from body to body yeah yeah that was pretty cool actually i, I like that scene and um i just was good to say because i'm a i haven't been listening lately but i i used to be a really avid listener of the lore podcast which always t- recounts uh, unusual and bizarre, sometimes surreal stories from history. And um, this story is actually based on these body snatchers in 1827 Scotland in mm-hmm. Edinburgh. Okay. Um, and uh, if you go back, I think it's Lore Podcast 47. I looked it up today, but I didn't actually have time to listen to it. They, ta- they discuss um, how the rise of modern medical <clears throat> surgeons and doctors and needing to explore human bodies actually led to this rash of body snatchers in that oh, time wow. period. And I think there's even more to the story, but yeah, I, I love how Neil Gaiman is always trying to weave in actual unusual, usually events from history and from mythology and from um, religion and stuff like that into his works. If you've ever read any more of his works, especially in the Sandman, they do that a lot. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. As well as American gods too, especially yes. the, the depiction mm-hmm. and the structure of the, those, uh, those particular religious deities that they had. Mm-hmm. Listen, that that was a that was a show. The first season was done very well. The second one kind of fell off after a while with the writing. Yeah, it was not good. <laughs> no, <laughs> but all right. So uh, we can move on to season four, chapter four, chapter four. The yeah. Hitchhiker featuring the minisode. Nazi zombie flesh eaters. <laughs> uh, I love it. I love it. Uh, Zerafael's good deed of picking up a hitchhiker on his way back to Soho proves to be a serious mistake. In 1941, Crowley and Zerafael encounter some surprising adversaries, old and new, as the Nazi spies who almost entrapped Zerafael return as zombies from the dead, intent on preventing him from attempting a bullet catch on the West End stage. That's a little misleading because really they weren't trying to stop his trick. They were just trying to prove that he and Crowley were working together. That's literally what it was. They were trying to catch them in the act of working together. And uh, that way they could bring it to Beelzebub and be like, aha, we got them. And then they could uh, knock knock off the punch card for the the, the, the zombies. The miracle blocker. Yeah. (laughs) Hell's TMZ. (laughs) Yeah, literally. They were trying to catch them in the act. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, I actually really like this one i i think it just it had the zombie element but also had it was the minisode was literally within that 1941 nazi germany and then they had that and then of course we get to see a nazi you know get eaten by a spider and <laughs> <laughs> defecated out and to a fly and then uh wash rinse repeat over and over <laughs> again meaning his eternity which Thankfully, that would be <laughs> for a Nazi, <laughs> a German Nazi uh, for that time. Uh, it, it was uh, a little bit weird to see it on that TV, though, because <laughs> mm-hmm. it was an old tube TV, CRT, and it's kind of all granulated. So it kind of makes up for the the CG that they used, but it kind of worked in its process. But I, I just really enjoyed this. Uh, I just loved the minisode because of the time it was in, and I just... Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe it's because I, I was as I was watching it, the 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 Nazi Germany part of it of like the bombs and everything, especially with the whole introduction. It's like, well, we'll find out if the bombs could kill us or whatever, and then they were gone and they were dead. Mm-hmm. But uh, to see hell the way it was and the hell that it was to get into hell with all the paperwork that you have to go through. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it just reminded me something way out of Beetlejuice. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I was like, yeah, yeah. Tim, 
yeah, and it, because if you remember when they they wind up being dead, Gina Davis and uh, oh, I'm forgetting his name, <laughs> but Jeff Goldblum, uh, Jeff, not Jeff Goldblum. No, oh no, Alan you're right, Baldwin, not, Alex Baldwin. And Alec Baldwin, yeah, one of the go. Baldwin, yeah. Yeah, well, speaking of Be- Beetlejuice, we're supposed to get Beetlejuice too, but who knows with this uh, writer's strike yeah. and and uh, we'll see. We'll see. But it, it was pretty cool, and then we plus we get to see a little bit more of Beelzebub and how she's involved with locating Gabriel w- while sending out checks. It's like that her right hand person to send down to do the dirty work to get Gabriel back. And I thought yeah, that I thought that cool. was an interesting aspect of the storyline of Beelzebub kind of being in charge of whatever that section was, or or several sections kind of being uh, not really, but like they all they also talk about taking his his body or taking Gabriel to Satan. So I wonder if we're going to see Satan this season or not, or if it's just going to be Beelzebub. I thought that was an interesting aspect of it, the fact that that Beelzebub is kind of like a. Um, wouldn't be the CEO, but would be the person just below the CEO, maybe? Like, if Satan is the CEO, then you have Beelzebub, who's the, whatever. Regional CFO. corporate I, manager. Sure, there you go. <laughs> Assistant to the regional corporate. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the guy with the eye patch, you know, that we've seen him a, a few times uh, th- throughout the, these episodes. But uh, yeah, that was, that was an interesting scene, showing us, kind of getting a glimpse of what hell is like. Yeah, I actually, well, I thought this episode... I like the creepy beginning with Shax as the hitchhiker. That gave me <laughs> nice, like, goosebump vibes. Uh, got a little bit dull for me the first time in the middle, which is funny because it has zombies and demons. It should be interesting. Yeah. But on second watch, I, I got into the fun of the horror of it and everything and uh, enjoyed it a little bit more. Well, the humor of it, of the zombies, mm-hmm. is what really got me because I just like that. Uh, it's like that Shona the Dead mm-hmm. goofiness of everything. And Especially when they're conscious zombies at that point and aware, uh-huh. even though they still have to eat the person that they see in uh, what was it? The a magic church shop. That... The magic shop. No, oh, oh, well, the... Yeah, the church also. Yeah. But yeah, yeah they... the church in the beginning. So they got full, full up on that. And then, of course, in the magic shop. Yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah. And then the antics that they had. It's like, sir, all the <laughs> sleight of hand tricks are over back that way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but. Yeah, I I really enjoyed it overall. Uh, it, it it kept me captivated, motivated. I don't know, maybe with the bullet catch, it just gave me that point of the prestige, and just mm. like, oh, I want to go back and watch that movie now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> with Hugh Jackman and Christian Bale, mm-hmm. and uh, that that was a big point in that movie too. But in this case, uh, you, you you're waiting for something. And what's this about paperwork about the mess that they could? So is this the first time that we're figuring out that if they get hurt or damaged in in this uh, on Earth, it's permanent or something? Can they be killed in some way and then brought back to heaven or hell? Yeah, or- I didn't I didn't understand that side that uh, that that part of what they were talking about the paperwork they would have to do if one of them got hurt. I didn't because we haven't seen that happen before, really. They mentioned yeah, you know. it in the first season. That they can be, their bodies can die. They can get discorporated. They'll just Mm. go back to heaven or hell. Mm. And then apparently there's a lot of paperwork that goes on with it before they have to go, before they can come back to earth. And Uh, we saw in first season when Azarafel got into the holy circle, he got sucked up into heaven. And -hmm. then he had to kind of find his way back down to earth again, but Mm. he didn't have a body to return to. That's why he had to uh, possess Madam Tracy. Okay, and Crowley was stuck in hell at one point in the bathtub, I recall, in the first season as well, and he had to find his way back. It wasn't Crowley. It wasn't? was his yeah, hell. That's, that's, right. that's right. That's right. I forgot. It's been so long. <laughs> they switched bodies so they could they could each endure the torture that they were going to get from uh, heaven and hell. Yeah, because so. it was a switcheroo. I forgot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Well, the things that we have to go back to now makes you want to go watch if you watch that season. <laughs> yeah, I did like getting the return of the three Nazis from season one, though. So we did get. Yeah. Uh, you know, I had I had mentioned um, when I wrote to Derek at TV Podcast Industries that I kind of missed seeing some of the characters from the first season, and I was hoping we'd get maybe Anathema or um, mm-hmm. uh, Madame Tracy or someone again. But we got the the Nazis. <laughs> <laughs> and we find out their fate after they get bombed. They go to hell and they're given the option to become zombie zombie spies for hell. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought that was great. And then, and then at the end, when they when they yeah, you know finish their mission, but they don't they don't actually uh, succeed. Uh, they're they're like, are you not going to turn us back to human? Oh no, no, you're eternally going to be a zombie now, <laughs> <laughs> living on Earth. And so I wonder if they're going to come up later as zombies, uh, either in this I season wonder. or possibly the next season. Uh, they got away, so maybe next yeah. season. And he said that they would be that way forever, you yeah, know, eternity, literally mm -hmm. on Earth, walk to walk mm -hmm. the Earth. Now the question <laughs> as is, his, is, as his left arm falls, <laughs> yeah. yeah, he goes here, hold this, but <laughs> the. I'm curious though if they bite somebody if it it's uh, something that becomes infectious or it's just something that's just mystified zombieism for that they have to roam around like that forever and that's their hell. Mm -hmm. That's the, basically their living hell if you think about mm -hmm. it. But at least they're not going down there with the spider and having to deal with that anymore. No. <laughs> Which is a worse fate. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Think about that. Well, they get the num nums for the brains too, so they get a little, you know, sweet taste of that at least. So these are Return of the Living Dead zombies. They have to go for the brains. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they don't just eat anything, any old human. They got they got to go for brains so that they yeah. can uh, get the residual thoughts. But they're not going to eat your eyes. They're not going to eat your eyes. They're not what? They're not going to eat your eyes. Isn't that how the song no. goes? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He continues the song that the the uh, was the was it the groundskeeper that they ate was singing. Yeah, time. and he just continues the song because mm -hmm. it's stuck in the brain and that he ate. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was pretty cool. His verse coming up again. Yep. Oh, another verse. Oh no. <laughs> uh, yeah, I do agree with you though. With uh, Shaxx in the very beginning, uh, it's like she she just basically pestered Aziraphale. The whole time mm -hmm. <laughs> to get the information. I know where he is now. And of <laughs> course, you know, later on we see her. She gets there. She can't get in. But he goes, you're more than welcome to look around mm -hmm. and you won't and find Gabriel, anything. <laughs> and Gabriel's in the background. Hello, customer. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and she can't see it. <laughs> yep. She doesn't recognize him. Uh, they, they did their their miracle exceptionally well. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's going to go too well at the very end where it's like, we have to show him to this person. <laughs> well, we then they got to do another miracle. <laughs> oh, it's more paperwork. <laughs> and I like what a bad liar Aziraphale is because she she mentions Gabriel and she's, she's like, Gabriel, who? Hey, oh, oh, I don't know, Gabriel. That's that's like someone who works at Apple who's like, Steve Jobs, who? I, I don't know this person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Steve Jobs, who? <laughs> oh. oh. Oh, okay. Uh, this is part of the mini-sode. Uh, I do like the fact that Crowley was actually willing to deliver. What's the name of this uh, of the show that they were doing at the, the theater? Was it the, the Ladies of, <laughs> of Lancelot? Camelot. 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 Okay. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, he's there to deliver the liquor, but of course the liquor gets... <laughs> the 80 bottles of li uh, whiskey gets broken because he was parked next to the church that got bombed. Mm -hmm. And then that's where they get into this whole thing where uh, because the magician was arrested by the Nazis. Uh, I forget what it was for. Um, deserter. Oh, he was a deserter. Yeah, he was a deserter. Right. right. I, uh -huh. thought it, I thought it was some sort of, um, you know, working with the, the other people, but. And then uh, he offers up his magics. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was pretty cool. The fact that he goes, I could help. Uh, I could help with the thrifty digitation. And he's there <laughs> hurting out with his hands. Yeah. I, love I love how Michael Sheen has, he says, I have skills in prestidigitation. Mm -hmm. He says it with such flourish. Yeah. Yeah. The flamboyancy of it. And now it's like he, he's there. He, you know, he's a showman. <laughs> mm -hmm. but uh the fact that they actually have to go to the magic shop and of course crowley is actually trying to be helpful and saying mm -hmm. you're a great magi magician <laughs> you can do this and it's like wow this is something positive from crowley at this point mm -hmm. it's not negative he's actually trying to help and support him yeah, and he's <laughs> like yeah yeah he's like you're gonna be a professional you're gonna be a professional musician. they're gonna pay you to be a musician you know so it's means you're a professional so, yeah i and thought then when the guy <laughs> Yeah, I, I thought it was pretty cool. And then they get yeah. to the magic shop, and of course, <laughs> the magic shop owner calls him an amateur. <laughs> what? I'm not an amateur. I'm working the West End <laughs> mm -hmm. of London. 
<laughs> for a major show. <laughs> and then uh then he shows him the rope trick, how long it'd be, and they're like, Oh, okay. He tries to do the sleight of hand with the with, with the, money. the rings, yeah, and the money and yeah. And, all yeah. The- it gets that point, but they're being looked at, monitored by the zombie Nazi zombies because they're trying to get that. Because Mr. Harmony tells them that he has they have to get that evidence. So the ring that they have to use to call him once they could get that moment captured and obviously get their notches clicked on their <laughs> uh subway card I mean, their magic <laughs> card to get back. Subway sandwich card. If you think about it, that's what I was thinking. And then, a miracle blocker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which actually did happen in the scene, but for, within the magic shop, they, uh, I love how it's like he, uh, the owner tells him the, in the back for the hand, uh, magics, uh, so the zombie and he's like, Ugh! and he's got the glasses <laughs> on at that point, still trying, but he tries to do the ring at the right moment and it's wrong because he's got something else on there. Or does he, does I forget, did he hurt his finger and it squirted? Or was there something else that he put on his finger that squirted? He picked up a gag ring that looked just like the ring that. Okay, that's what I thought it was. <laughs> and it squirted ink in his face. So and then they couldn't make it at that time. So yeah, <laughs> I thought it was funny. <laughs> and then they were able to do it. But they uh, then there was that whole business about the uh, the catching the bullet. Yeah, I love how at the, at the beginning, you know, they're on stage there, and, and uh, Aziraphale asks if anyone in the audience knows how to uh, how to fire a weapon or or use the, use the rifle. Army, and like like it's all army guys, and everybody's hands go up except for Crowley. Like he's the only one who's just like he's not paying attention at all. And so finally, when Aziraphale points him out, Crowley goes, "Oh yeah, 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 yeah I can do it." So <laughs> like, sir, dude. sir, you and everybody's like, "Okay, not me." Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the fact that Aziraphale has a. Uh, uh, a, a gun license and a and a derringer in his shop, and it, Crowley doesn't even know how to shoot a gun. Yeah, it's perfectly thought, ironic. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, he goes, "Oh, you must have shot lots of times because you're a demon, and <laughs> you must know your way around guns." Oh yeah, mm-hmm. sure, sure. <laughs> but of course, you know, Aziraphale has it in a book hollowed out. In <laughs> I forget what book he told. He mentioned it, and then uh, he said, "Just in case." <laughs> which is funny yeah yeah especially when you think of london and all the the rules and laws they have there so but and also he's an angel <laughs> he's an a angel. Gun. he can run yeah. miracles <laughs> yeah he could change people's minds if he wanted to with a miracle <laughs> Yeah, I love how he had to throw out his whole entire act because of the miracle blocker. You know, he's trying to change the turnip into a uh, an ink well, and it's not yeah. happening. And he's like, "Okay, let's skip right to the end to the bullet catch," to, and it actually ends up working. You know, as, um, Crowley misses him. Um, the bullet goes into the wall right above the uh, the promoter there, and uh, then Michael Sheen smiles and he's got the bullet in his in his teeth, and everybody shears. And uh, so it was really it was really cool to see, like you said, Laura. That's very very endearing to see them kind of working together and stuff. But then. Of course, Shax takes that picture with the Polaroid and threatens them with it, which that was a little strange to me. Why would you give your evidence to the people that you're black, <laughs> like that you're yeah. trying to get? Mr. You know, Harmony cause... is not bright at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, considering, look, look at how his day started. You know, he went to go get a cup of flame and it just burnt up his cup. And yeah. then, you know, Shax at that point just grabs it and it just drinks it with no problem. So he, he was having a bad day as it was. He wanted to be moved up. He wanted to be, you know, do something better with his job. So he thought this was his, you know, his way of like moving up the ranks. Mm-hmm. But, and I like that course, they bring back uh, Aziraphale's um, penchant for wanting to be a magician because that was in the first season too. Mm-hmm. He, yep. he tells uh, Crowley that he can do a magic trick at the kid's p- birthday party. And it, it turns out, terribly just like this one and when Crowley tells him maybe we should maybe you should give up on the magic <laughs> <laughs> and it's just hilarious that Azarifel loves these little things I mean he can perform like spectacular miracles but he wants to learn practical magic right yeah. well, he wants to be more human and I mm-hmm. think that's between both of them how they feel whether a demon wants to be a little bit more human and be involved with that and staying on earth 
Mm-hmm. I think that's why Crowley wants to stay because he just likes the idea. He likes the madness of it, of how humans can be. Whereas Azurafel is more attracted to the people and how they can be with love and mm-hmm. interest. And, and then Crowley has that kind of same interest as well to some degree. And that's why attracts them to be together on, on the earth but yeah they <laughs> this was uh yeah this was a fun one uh, i just like the whole conversation though within the uh <laughs> within the dressing room when the zombie uh mr harmony brings in the zombies at that point and and crowley does not recognize mr harmony mr harmony goes i was with you during the wars i was the monkey on your backside i was there helping you right along with you you should know my name yeah Uh, yeah. nope not a clue we fought side by side (laughs) yeah that was not a clue sorry (laughs) you aren't that (laughs) yes you know that's there's a moment there i didn't notice in the first watch but in in, well actually this was my first watch of, of, of episode four but you know that moment when um even though crowley even though they don't succeed in proving that crowley and aziraphale were working together he still gets sucked sucked down into hell and that's when we get that throw almost seemed like a throwaway line from Aziraphale that and I didn't see Crowley for a long time after that and so we now we're going to have to have some sort of a time jump of when's the next time they're going to see each other because in 1941 he got sucked into hell Mm. Uh, actually in Edinburgh is it okay after he had his laudanum and he did his good deed even though he said that's okay Mad on um, mad on laudanum that made him okay do okay now I'm confused. So maybe 1941 was the next the time next he saw time. him again. Yeah. yeah, almost 100 years later. So okay, that's that. Now that makes sense. Thank you. Uh-huh. I was a little confused. I'm getting the two episodes mixed up in my head now, <laughs> which actually tells us exactly what happens with laudanum to them at that point. I wonder what it, it does that to Crowley, but what would it do to Zerafel? I'm curious what that mm-hmm. would happen. What would happen to him? Because you got a demon that would do that to a demon, but will be a different effect on to uh, Zerophil. Yeah. Okay. Anything yeah. else? I just love the depictions of heaven and hell as basically two very different workplaces. Mm-hmm. <laughs> hell is like the worst factory style office you could ever see it's got bad lighting it's got cramped quarters no windows it's um just dirty it's dirty yeah, disgusting it's, and yeah. hell heaven is almost the opposite but just as bad it's it's yeah. completely uh generic and sanitized and you know n- not a single uh extra or personalized uh, thing nothing to give it any warmth at all <laughs> yeah right, it's right. like not a spot of dirt anywhere mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and it's just so yeah like you said it was too sanitary and mm-hmm. on top of that it's too bright <laughs> whereas yes, it was with, everywhere. <laughs> yeah with, whereas with hell it was a little bit different but you also have that recording that introduces everybody to where they are and it's mm-hmm. constantly going so Think of working in that condition as a demon. As you're doing paperwork, you got to hear this over again mm-hmm. and again and again. And we find out that hell is just red tape, petty bureaucracies, and, <laughs> and lots of paperwork. Yep. But uh, the, the one note that I had that I thought was very funny is uh, when they uh, were trying to practice the, the bullet catch and they were trying to go over and how they were going to do everything. Uh, Crowley's American accent to, to a Zerafel. Like, yes. It was it was pretty funny. <laughs> it's like the the typical British uh, humor of how how do you, how how the English they think of Americans mm-hmm. when they speak. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was it for me. If you that's, have anything else, that's all I got. The only thing I looked up in the, you guys can debate me if this is right or wrong. And uh, I had thought about this a while back, but if we were to give Azarafel and Crowley their D and D alignments, I believe that Azarafel would be lawful good and Crowley would be chaotic and neutral. At first I thought chaotic evil, but then I looked up the, uh, definitions and lawful good is a lawful good character typically, 
typically acts with compassion and always with honor and a sense of duty. However, Hmm. lawful good characters will often regret taking any action they fear would violate their code, even if they recognize such action as being good. Whereas chaotic neutral is a chaotic neutral character is an individualist who follows their own heart and generally shirks rules and traditions. Although chaotic neutral characters promote the ideals of freedom, it is their own freedom that comes first. Good and evil come second to their need to be free, which sounds a lot like Crowley to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. Yeah, he does it for his own self intentions and his curiosity, I think. And I felt it was not chaotic evil because it said that chaotic evil characters are, they care more about their freedom than even the lives or well being of anyone else. Yeah. It's, it, yeah. Probably- yeah. It's not, it's definitely, it's not chaotic good. Uh, it's, I don't remember the definition of chaotic good. Uh, I know in my, in my twenties, when I played a little bit of D and D, I think I often lean toward a chaotic neutral character just as if you could basically do your own thing you could do basically whatever you wanted you weren't you weren't held into a strict guideline of well you have to act like this mm-hmm. you know and, and uh um so that that's where i think that's where i my, a lot of my characters fell was in that chaotic neutral kind of hmm. but just thought it would be interesting to uh figure this out since they're both trying to pull and push each other a little bit mm-hmm. towards the center again you know because they they uh, Crowley tries to pull the good out of, I mean, as Zarafel tries to pull the good out of Crowley, while mm-hmm. Crowley tries to get him to uh, shirk the rules sometimes when he sees that it's not going to line up with his morality or Zarafel's morality. Mm-hmm. That's all I had. Yeah. That was pretty cool. I like that. I, I love your little uh, <laughs> analysis with D&D references. Mm-hmm. I'm sure somebody out there has the same thought, too. But if you guys do, always write in. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I don't have any more quotes. Basically, I just had that. Yeah. That one. And that was it. The only one I had was the the demon who was uh, talking to Beelzebub. <laughs> And I thought he had a great quote that said, a day that I don't get sent to the dung pits is a good day. Like words to live by. That is words yeah. to live by. <laughs> I, and I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued with Mr. Uh, was it Shax or Mr. Harmony? I guess it was Shax who approached Beelzebub about wanting to attack the bookshop. Yes. And, uh, and uh, she says, you know, she says, well, are you, are you uh, telling me to do that? Do you want me to do that? And Beelzebub was like, no, I'm ordering you to do it and, and take all these, all the forces of hell against the bookshop. So it's going to be interesting to see um, that play out over the next couple episodes, because of course, Gabriel being the supreme um, archangel, mm-hmm. you know, how is that going to, how is, how is that fight going to go? Um, mm-hmm. Be interesting to see what, uh, what happens there. I'm, I'm intrigued by that. Like I, I'm, uh, I want to see how that's going to get depicted on screen. I think it's going to be interesting. Same here. And of course, we need the we need the uh, the finish our storyline with the two women and with Muriel doing her investigation. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we didn't talk about that in episode three when she goes into the coffee shop and is talking to the um, the black woman, the African American woman, Ina. Uh, Ina mm-hmm. Thank you um, mm-hmm. about love and what her well, you know, what kind of things she she thinks about about love and so get out of my shop you know yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, she stopped um, that pretty quickly especially because mm-hmm. the woman who came in for coffee earlier said oh so someone's got a particular type of kink <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. well that that was it for me so i i think uh i'm done uh what about you guys that's all I got. That's all you got. All right. Well, well, I'm, I'm ready for these next next couple episodes and see where they take us. Cool. Uh, all right. Well, that was our coverage of uh, Good Omens season two, episodes three and four. So uh, we're going to move right along into uh, podcast recommendations. Uh, you know the 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 two that I have, and we've we've talked about them before. The podcastica. Mm-hmm. Um, the podcast has one called the Star Wars cast where they're covering Ahsoka 
on there. Uh, it's really good. Jonathan James and Kristen are doing that one. And then, of course, the Revisited podcast with Ben and Kristen. They are finishing up Lost. Uh, they're going to actually the final the series finale is going to be recorded this week. And then uh, in a couple of weeks, they uh, may do a short one over a kind of a deleted scene from Lost. Uh, they're going to do a short one over that, and then they'll move into Ted Lasso with the, the Revisited podcast. So it's going to be interesting to, to watch Ted Lasso again, because I just recently watched it, uh, watched the first two seasons, and of course, only watched the third season once. So Yeah, it's weird. I only watched the, the first season, I, I think, twice when it, during the time when it came out. Or no, no, it was like, actually, it was almost by season two. Mm -hmm. Because we were in Hershey at that time, and I think that's when uh, season two came out. And then uh, I watched it then, and then I watched it, I would say, about six months ago. So it's Mm -hmm. been a little bit, so I could always go back and revisit and watch it as I listen to them and their coverage. So, yeah. And then, yeah, you said it with uh, James and Jonathan and Kristen on the uh, Star Wars cast on podcast doing Ahsoka. That's good, too. And they should be coming out with, uh, what is it, episode four? Uh, yeah, episode four is going to be tomorrow. Um, we're recording this on Tuesday, so episode four will drop tomorrow. I don't know when they'll record it. They record usually Thursday or Friday. Yeah, that'll be cool. And then to add to that, uh, for podcast I love, uh, I would say Run For Your Lives with their coverage. They're actually covering Deep Impact this week. So they're, they're asking, well, oh, by the time you guys get this, it'll probably be towards the end of the week and it would already be dropped, but you can always go listen to it. And uh, I'll try to leave feedback for that too, because I really did enjoy Deep Impact in comparison to Armageddon. Uh, both are very similar because they came around the same time that year. But mm-hmm. uh, I always, uh, I always was drawn more towards Deep Impact for some reason. I don't know, maybe it's because of, uh, more dra- how more dramatic it was in comparison to Armageddon where you had all the humor inside and the heavy action because it was a, I think it was a Bruckheimer film that one but with Deep Impact it was a little bit more dramatic because you had Tay Leone and she wasn't playing your typical comedic style she was playing more of a more serious dramatic character and then we had Morgan Freeman who was probably one of the best presidents on screen <laughs> so uh, i'm looking forward to that and then uh obviously uh just to promote what i was doing recently i was just recently on fantasy picks movie edition and we did our top five movie posters that are out there too so you could check out what we thought you know it was like a kind of like a fantasy pick kind of movie poster poll uh, unfortunately, there was issues with uh, recording the first time, so we had to record it again. Uh, that's what happens when computers crash in the middle of recording. But uh, yeah, you can check that out, too. So obviously, yeah, like I said, run for your lives on podcast go with uh, Deep Impact and then uh, Fantasy Picks Movie Edition uh, with our top five movie posters of all time on uh, Power Core Entertainment. Great. Lara? I don't know. I haven't been able to watch a lot lately, but I have been slowly going back through, is it season four of Black Mirror with um, Cake and Rima over at Strange Indeed covering it? Yeah. And that's been a really great season. So I am down to the last episode and I've enjoyed all the ones that I've watched this season. I'm going to watch the last one and then who knows by the time I'm done with that, I might try and go back and finish watching Mike Flanagan's Midnight Club. Midnight Mass. I, Midnight Club. No, yeah. Midnight, Midnight Club, Club. Yeah. I only Midnight got halfway yeah. through that. I didn't get to finish it the first time. And uh, Mike Flanagan's coming up with a new series, limited series on Netflix. His last one, um, Fall of the House of Usher, which I'm super stoked for. So I think I want to finish up Midnight Club before that one starts in October. Mm. Yeah, that's uh, the the full House of Usher. That's going to be a more modern take on an Edgar Allan Poe story, I believe. Mm -hmm. And it's modern in the sense that I grew up with the whole Vincent Price version (laughs) way back when. So this is going to be a little bit hard to consume at times because I I just I look at that as kind of the old hammer and uh, even universal monster days. Like, I just look at them as classics, 
Yeah. And like, how dare you <laughs> cover, <laughs> you know, remake this. But uh, I'll, I'll take it with a grain of salt and just watch it and see if I do like it and keep an open mind. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. And when uh, I'm pretty sure that Remand Paker, they're, they're going to be doing that one as well, from my mm-hmm. understanding. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah. Uh, for a little bit of news out there for you listeners uh, who are into Neil Gaiman. So if you go to shop.gaiman-foreplay.com, you could actually purchase his. They, they, a lot of people saying it's his debut album. I'm thinking that he did another one. <laughs> it just says new album, but it's called Signs of Life. And uh, it's with the four play string quartet. And uh, they have colored vinyl editions. They have the CDs as well. And you could secure it on that. I will leave the link below in the, the show notes. So that way, if you guys are interested in purchasing it. So uh, aside from the WGA strikes and the uh, Actors uh, Guild, the sag after strikes that are going on, Mr. Gaiman is hard at work making music, too as well and uh he's also a teacher so there are a few presentations going on at bard college i have not looked when he is scheduled but he could always go there he could always go to the bard college website because that he is a professor there and he does um they do sell tickets for those events that he does uh, a lot of them are writing classes or lectures or sometimes we'll have uh you know guest on to interview uh, who are the writers or people of in film industry? But at this point, probably not people in film industry. It's probably going to be more writers. But uh, right now we're at the point of, well, sending in your feedback. Unfortunately, I didn't put anything in. It was kind of last minute. We just threw this together. So I didn't put an image up. Sorry about that. But on the weekend before we actually do this next week, I, I will be putting in an image. So that way, if you guys feel the need and you want to say and get your voice heard or write something down, you you can. So uh, before we get into the actual getting us the feedback, the best thing you could do is tell a friend. Word of mouth is the best thing. And you could tell them where we could be heard, which would be Spotify, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, or whatever podcast player of choice. And if you're there or your friend is there, please give us a rating or review. Apple Podcasts is the preferred method of rating, uh, uh, apparently. So uh, a lot of people do judge their podcast listening on those. Uh, We've had a few. I think we have a total of six or seven for Panels to Pixels. I have a total of five on Adrenaline Cinema Podcast. So it's it's a great thing. So if you guys could you know do that it would be greatly appreciated and if you could actually write notes because they stand out more so yeah yeah and just be honest that's that's i i always i'm always honest with mine and i will send it out you know i don't mind criticism it's fine uh you could find us on facebook and that's usually where you could send your feedback i like i said i would put an image up there saying what we're covering on the next episode and you just leave your comments down below that image All you have to do is go to facebook.com forward slash panels to pixels. And we have an email panels to pixels one at gmail.com panels spelt out two spelt out to and pixels in the number one at Gmail. Uh, You could just write out a regular texted email and your thoughts and we'll read them on the podcast when we're there. Doesn't necessarily have to be for the particular episode that we're covering. It could be a previous one so that, you know, you, you, if you feel like, what I did on Howard the Duck with Des uh, and had fun with that. You could say, or how bad the movie was. I don't, you know, I don't mind. Go ahead. Uh, Everybody has opinions and I allow them here, but uh, yeah, you could easily just write it out and we'll, we'll read it on the podcast. Or if you feel like you don't want us to read your (laughs) feedback from an email, you could easily record yourself with the devices that you have out there iPads, computers, everything has a built-in microphone. Just record yourself, save it as a WAV file or whatever, and then send it as an attachment, and we'll play it on the podcast, and that way you can be part of the podcast. Uh, And then we'll punch that in, and we'll actually give comments, too, or laugh, because every time Steve does, and he does a live (laughs) Steve, 
we have fun because we've got to laugh at it. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's like, laugh. well, it's fun to listen to it. It's like, it's like you getting your express, uh, expression <laughs> as your first watching. So it's like, it's a laugh of like happiness of like, wow, he's really into it. Or, wow, he didn't like that part. Or, <laughs> you got the mic drop. Yeah. Uh, you could get a, you could listen to us or, watch us on youtube so you can find us on youtube all you have to do is search panels to pixels podcast subscribe ring the bell please give us a thumbs up while you're there uh, a lot of people use that as a platform we did get feedback and fortunately i did not pick it so i will be picking it and i'll be putting it in the notes for next week i was kind of busy with work i've been doing at least 12 hour days, depending on <laughs> the day that it is. So it's like 10 plus or 12 plus. So uh, you'll get that in next week. Uh, we could be found on Instagram. So I do be, been doing promotion on that. So at panels to pixels podcast. So just check it out there. I'll throw the image. I actually been promoting the episodes on that as well. And people have been liking it. And I've noticed a lot of new listeners not just from people following us on Instagram or Facebook, because I see it, everybody. <laughs> and I I'm, I thank you, too. It's awesome that we're, we're getting this attention. So, uh, you know, I, I guess I've been <laughs> pretty much paying attention to a lot of this stuff lately now. It, it's fun. Good. But, uh, yeah, you could uh, follow us on uh, at Panels to Pixels podcast on Instagram. And then uh, you, you'll be apprised of what we're going to be covering and what is out already. So, uh, but now we're at the point of where else can listeners hear us? Well, as Mark mentioned, I uh, do send in voicemails to various podcasts that our friends do. And uh, sometimes I'll do a live Steve uh, where I'm just basically recording my thoughts as I go uh, through an episode of TV or a movie, depending on what the uh, uh, the thing is, and uh, people seem to enjoy it. So I'm going to keep doing it as long as people keep enjoying it. So <laughs> keep doing it, Steve. Ah, um, thank you. I can be here here intermittently <laughs> on and off on uh, this one with uh, someone named Steve <laughs> covering The Witcher sometimes. <laughs> yeah, we'll be back. <laughs> and uh, also on Adrenaline Cinema podcast, where we recently did um interview with the Vampire AMC's show um recently with Danny. Mm -hmm. and that was a fun show. Um, we just covered the entire first season, which was really fun. So yeah, yeah I'll pop in every now and then. And we'll be back to on Adrenaline Cinema Podcast to cover the actual what year was interview with the vampire. Uh, 1990 like 90s, I think. yeah so we'll be covering the original movie before season two of interview with a vampire comes uh, Brad Pitt out and tom cruise movie that uh -huh. is and so christian slater right too much sexy yeah. Yeah. and christian antonio banderas mm -hmm. yep but uh we'll have some interesting and unknown facts for that particular movie we'll be covering it uh we'll discuss how it holds up today uh, we'll probably give uh, some mentions to the sequel that came out after that, which was Queen of the Damned, I believe. And uh, we might eventually cover that <laughs> because that's another Lestat yeah. uh, movie. I'll suffer my way through it. <laughs> <laughs> I found it amusing. But, and it's nice to hear that the AMC has made separate contracts with both Walking Dead and the interview with the Vampire series. So those um, those two franchises are are back on track. They're back on track. There were amendments that were made through SAG AFTRA, and the and they were written before the WGA strikes. So since they already had them in the can, just like with Kevin Smith who I follow as well and, and have met a bunch of times and interviewed here on this particular podcast. Kevin is filming his new feature, the 430 film. So he was able to get an amendment. So AMC was still able to do that with Walking Dead related content as well as with Interview with Vampire. So they're starting to make certain sort of amendments because they know if they fall back on this stuff, a lot of the content will be out there. So, uh, 
you know, the strike should still keep going. They should come to some sort of uh, compromise on both ends. And I do agree with the, the Writers Guild, and I do agree with the actors. They all should be paid in some way. Uh, that's just my thought. But, you know, it's the higher ups in, in the uh, the film industry and, and TV industry at this point. And hopefully they'll come to an agreement and then we'll be back on track and we'll have more content for you. So uh, with that, that was our episode of Pounds to Pixels on Good Omen Season 2, Episodes 3 and 4. Look forward to uh, Season 2, Episodes four, well, 5 and 6. So uh, we'll be doing that next week. So check that out and check uh, the media that we mentioned so that way you can be up to date. So I am Mark. I'm Steve. And I'm Laura. Same podcast, different panel, different pixel. And this is Panels to Pixels podcast. We will see you on the next panel. Good night, night. everybody. Good night.